I'm really delighted to be able to present today's speaker, um, Cheryl Lee Tareen, um, whose talk is a part of our uh, mini series on um, Islam in South Asia. And his talk will be followed by comments um, from our own um, Shudipto Kaburaj, um, who is hopefully joining, he's been trying to get in, so hopefully he's here uh, or will be joining us in a moment. Um, so I'll just take a few minutes to um, introduce um, Professor Tareen, um, who is an associate professor in Franklin and Marshall's uh, Religious Studies Department, uh, where he is currently serving as the department chair. He received his PhD from Duke University in Religious Studies, where I first had the opportunity to um, meet him uh, when he was a graduate student and I was um, still at, at Duke before coming to Columbia. Uh, and I see Shadipto has joined us. Welcome. Uh, so we're, we're all in place now. Um, uh, Cheryl Lee's research focuses on Muslim intellectual traditions and debates in early and modern South, um, South Asia. His book, Defending Muslim, uh, sorry, his book, Defending Muhammad in Modernity, which was published in 2020 um, by Notre Dame Press, University of Notre Dame Press, offers a new and innovative perspective on the Borelvi Deobandi polemic over the proper practice of Islam. Um, this book won the American Institute for Pakistan Studies Book Prize in 2020 and was a finalist for the 2021 AAR Book Prize. Um, he's published a, a number of articles. I'll just mention the titles of um, some of his recent ones. Thinking the Question of Religious Minorities in Colonial India, Some Notes on Intra-Muslim and Hindu-Muslim Encounters. Uh, he has another Muslim political theology before and after empire, uh, Shah Muhammad Ismail's station of leadership. Um, and um, uh, two, those are very recent. And then 2017 article, translating the other early modern understandings of Hinduism. Um, he's also the co-editor of the edited volume, Imagining the Public in South Asia, um, published in 2016 by Rutledge. Um, He's currently working on his second book project, which is called The Promise and Peril of Hindu-Muslim Friendship. And today we'll be hearing um, about some of the material that he's been working on for this project. Uh, the title of his talk today is The Cow and the Caliphate, Debating Hindu-Muslim Friendship in Colonial South Asia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Shara Lee Tareen. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ewing, uh, for this wonderful and generous introduction, uh, for inviting me. Uh, uh, it is a real honor and privilege and treat to be speaking, albeit virtually, at uh, Columbia. Uh, I've always considered Columbia sort of as a academic uh, and intellectual uh, distant home for me, uh, in which I have really benefited from scholars of all generations, senior scholars, those more sort of from my generation. Now, increasingly, the fabulous graduate students at Columbia whose work I've really benefited from. So it's a real honor to be here. And I uh, want to especially thank Professor Shudab Tokaviraj uh, for sparing his uh, time. Uh, it is a real honor uh, and privilege to be in conversation with him. Uh, his work has been absolutely fundamental uh, to my research, to my first book, uh, to this book. So this is a really great treat and gift with which to start uh, the new academic uh, semester. Uh, I have prepared some comments to stay within my 35 minutes or so, but I will try to perform them uh, so that I can take you along with me. So as uh, Professor Ewing mentioned, today I will be sharing with you some fragments of a chapter from my current and second book project, which I'm tentatively titling uh, Perilous Intimacy, Debating Interreligious Friendship After Empire, which looks at traditions of intra-Muslim scholarly debates on the boundaries of Hindu-Muslim friendship from the late 18th to the mid 20th century. The central conceptual question that animates this project is this. How did the traditionalist seminary educated South Asian Muslim scholars or the ulama negotiate the incongruence between the pre-modern context of Muslim empire that informed foundational normative texts and attitudes towards non-Muslims 
and the setting of colonial modernity that saw Muslims in South Asia rendered into a numerical as well as a political minority. My main argument is that while the loss of Muslim political sovereignty and the emergence and eventual consolidation of British colonial power and conditions in South Asia served as the immediate backdrop of intensified intra-Muslim contest on the boundaries of Hindu-Muslim friendship, paradoxically, at stake and work in these contestations were precisely the logics and the uh, textures of an imperial Muslim political theology. In my talk today, I will try to present one specific illustration of this larger argument. Uh, I want to begin, though, by showing you an image that gestures at the contextual setting of the intra-Muslim debate I will talk about today. So I'll just quickly share the screen. This image uh, that I hope you can see is from the November 1881 issue of the famous satirical Urdu weekly Awad Panch, published from Lucknow between 1877 and 1937 and modeled on the London-based weekly magazine Punch. We see here a cow with the head and ears of a donkey being pulled in opposite directions by a group of Muslim butchers on the one side and Hindus of different castes on the other. Above the cow, we find written the word ta'assub or bigotry or intolerance, thus framing cow slaughter through a modernist lens as a contentious issue that placed the body of the cow in the crossfire of competing varieties of religious obscurantism. My talk today explores Muslim scholarly discourses and debates on cow sacrifice in colonial South Asia. To raise and address larger questions about the interaction of colonial power, Muslim traditionalism, and interreligious friendship. In the contemporary Indian context, the history of and the violence generated by the Hindu nationalist cow protection movement has attracted tremendous popular and scholarly attention as well as alarm. But investing affective and political attachments and projects in the body of the cow as an index and marker of, of religious purity and superiority is not a solely Hindu nationalist phenomenon. In my talk today, by taking you to a moment exactly a century ago, I will show and argue that the cow represented a site of tremendous anxiety and opportunity for competing groups of prominent Indian Muslim scholars as well. Indeed, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the question of cow slaughter emerged as a subject of tremendous contestation and controversy among South Asian Muslim scholars or the ulama generating copious and passionate responses. While opinions on this matter varied considerably for heuristic purposes, we can posit two broad tendencies found among the Muslim scholarly elite. On the one hand was a group of scholars who urged the Indian Muslim masses to refrain from cow slaughter and sacrifice, especially on the occasion of Eid, so as not to offend the normative sensibilities of the Hindu community. A key ingredient in their attempt to foster Hindu-Muslim solidarity and camaraderie was their exhortation that Indian Muslims keep away from cow sacrifice and instead sacrifice other animals like goats and sheep. Now, their argument was based not on some abstract appeal to pluralism, but on the specific Islamic legal observation that cow sacrifice is not an obligatory, but only a simply permissible practice in Islamic law. Hence, refraining from it posed no normative pitfalls. One can name scholars like Malvi Abdul Bari, died 1926, of the rationalist Farangi Mahal school, on whom the second half of my talk today will focus, and Abul Kalam Azad, died 1958, as prominent examples of scholars who held this position. Another group of Muslim scholars vigorously resisted and opposed this argument. They counter-argued that cow sacrifice was a symbol of Muslim distinction in India, shi'ar islam plural, shi'ar islam and thus abandoning this practice amounted to the shame and humiliation of Muslims. While they agreed that cow sacrifice and the consumption of beef were generally not obligatory, their argument was that in the specific context of colonial India, abandoning a distinctive symbol of Islam for the sake of appeasing or under the pressure and coercion of Hindus was forbidden. Therefore, by implication, 
for Indian Muslims, cow sacrifice was indeed obligatory, so their argument went. One of the chief exponents of this argument was the prolific and the towering traditionalist scholar, Ahmad Raza Khan, died 1921, whose thought I will engage in the first half of this talk. My argument today is that in this intra-Muslim debate that often took the form of an acerbic polemic, the cow served as the material and discursive battleground on which competing visions of the normative relationship between religious identity and difference and boundaries of inter-religious friendship were articulated and contested. The cow, in other words, were, was normatively invested in opposing conceptions of the political. I will center my attention on two illustrative and arguably the two most influential examples of Muslim traditionalist or ulama engagements with the cow question, the opposing views on this matter aired by Ahmad Raza Khan and Abdul Bari, uh, whom I just mentioned. Who were these two figures? Uh, let me begin with Ahmad Raza Khan. A prominent Hanafi jurist and a major Sufi master from the Qadri uh, order, Ahmad Raza Khan was the founder of what is called the Bareilly Sunni orientation in South Asia, named after the town of Bareilly in Uttar Pradesh in Northern India, where he was from. A virtuoso polymath, Khan excelled and wrote widely in all disciplines of the Muslim humanities, including Quran interpretation and commentary, Sufism, Hadith, law, jurisprudence, philosophy, and even the natural sciences. He was also an arch polemicist who fought biting intellectual battles on several fronts against other Muslim and non-Muslim groups and individuals. In popular commentary and at times even in serious scholarship, the Bareilly school that Ahmad Raza Khan founded is often presented as a form of soft, mystically promiscuous, populist or inclusive brand of Islam, set in contrast with the allegedly harsh legalism of its chief rival, uh, the Dioban school that was founded in 1866. In what follows, I will show that Ahmad Raza Khan was anything but these things. I will also show that like most versatile and sophisticated scholars, he was remarkably adept at combining and keeping together idealist positions, dogged, uh, doggedly critical of any hint of interreligious intimacy with more pragmatic stances when so required by circumstance or power dynamics. Khan was at the center of the cow sacrifice debate. His most comprehensive and widely circulated cited and contested text on this topic, to a close reading of which I will now turn, was called The Finest Viewpoint on Cow Sacrifice, Anfus al-Fikr fi Qurban al-Bakr, henceforth the finest viewpoint. This Urdu text, liberally interspersed with Arabic, was composed as a legal opinion, a fatwa, in 1880. By tracing the highlights and trajectory of Khan's discourse, I will explore ways in which he presented cow sacrifice as a symbol of Muslim distinction. I will argue that while Khan's anxieties over preserving public markers of Muslim distinction were animated by the condition of being a colonized minority, the normative imaginary that informed his discourse was steeped in an imperial Muslim political theology. In the absence of Muslim political sovereignty in conditions of colonialism, the cow, or more accurately, the death of the cow, held the promise of sovereign power and dominance in the realm of ritual life. The sacrificed cow was not only a marker and symbol of Muslim distinction, on it also hinged the gift of sovereign power during a moment fraught with the crisis of sovereignty. A quick but useful word on terminology before proceeding. For Khan, cow sacrifice on special devotional occasions like Eid, the Urdu Qurbani or the Arabic Uziya and cow slaughter for everyday purposes, or gao kushi, though ritually distinct, were nonetheless part of the same ritual economy, and thus normatively overlapping. In other words, both cow sacrifice and cow slaughter were important markers of Muslim ritual distinction. Even if, even if cow sacrifice on days like Eid was a more devotionally charged act, its distinction from everyday cow slaughter was only a matter of ritual procedure and not one that could be mapped onto the secular binary of sacrifice and mere killing. Khan composed the finest viewpoint in response to the following question posed to him by a questioner from Muradabad in 1880, and I will share that with you uh, on share screen. So this questioner from Muradabad asks as follows. This is in the middle of the page. In the Hanafi school of law, which is a predominant Muslim legal school in South Asia, is cow sacrifice an obligatory practice such that abandoning it would constitute a sin that harms a Muslim salvation or puts her outside the fold of Islam? 
What about someone who believes cow sacrifice in the consumption of beef to be permissible, but does not actually sacrifice cows or consume beef? Would the salvational prospects of such a person be injured? Is there any sin attached to a Muslim who, while understanding cow sacrifice a permissible practice, nonetheless refrains from it in consideration of the disorder and unrest that this act might generate, potentially bringing harm to the Muslim community? Now, generally, cow sacrifice falls under the category of practices in Islamic law that are neither obligatory nor forbidden but simply permissible, uh, mubah as they're called, meaning practices, the commission or omission of which bear no salvational consequences. So the interpretive challenge confronting Ahmad Raza Khan was thus to show that in the specific context of colonial India, cow sacrifice was not simply permissible, but in fact, obligatory. In responding to this challenge, Khan argued and emphasized that the normative value of a practice, meaning obligatory, forbidden, permissible, etc., stipulated in the Sharia depended not only on the intrinsic nature of an act, but also on the external conditions and context that enwrap that act. In the context of colonial India, he elaborated, cow sacrifice represented among the foremost signs and markers of Muslim distinction. Again, this crucial category of sha'are Islam, singular sha'are Islam, referred to in the Quran primarily in regards to Muslim obligatory practices like the annual pilgrimage to uh, Mecca, the Hajj, in late 19th and 20th century South Asian Muslim reformist thought, the category of Shi'ar became cemented as an index of Muslim distinction in a much wider ambit of everyday rituals and practices. At the heart of Khan's argument was the claim that since cow sacrifice was a public marker of Muslim distinction that distinguished Indian Muslims from other religious communities, it signified Islam's honor and dominance in the public sphere. In the absence of Muslim political sovereignty, it was in the choreography of ritual life and performance that sovereign power was enshrined. In effect, abandoning such a practice for the appeasement or under the pressure of a non-Muslim community like the Hindus amounted to Islam's humiliation. As Khan pointedly put it, and I quote him here, our Sharia can never desire our humiliation. Now, notice that conceptually, Khan's hermeneutical program articulated as and assumed an imperial Muslim political theology, whereby the underlying purpose of law was the maintenance and preservation of Islam's dominance and power. Law represented a simulacrum for power. Also notice that Khan's legal imaginary took for granted the grammar and assumptions of empire that had informed the formulation of concepts like markers of Muslim distinction in medieval and early modern Hanafi legal texts composed in the context of Islamdom. Despite the colonized status of Muslims in modern India, he assumed the perfect translatability of discursive concepts and desires intimately entangled with the condition of pre-modern Muslim political sovereignty. But, and this point is crucial to my larger argument today. While articulating and presuming an imperial Muslim political theology, it is not as if Khan was oblivious to or that he ignored the reality of British colonial power. Exactly to the contrary, he was not only keenly aware of British presence, but also closely attuned to the opportunities and benefits afforded by that presence. So for instance, while arguing for the preservation of Muslim markers of distinction, Khan frequently invoked the colonial promise of tolerance towards individual religious communities and of its commitment to ensuring the freedom of religion. The Urdu term used by him was mazhabi azadi. Pressuring Indian Muslims to abstain from cow sacrifice, he often proclaimed, represented an abomination that the colonial authorities should never allow. Now, there are two aspects of Ahmad Raza Khan's engagement with the colonial state and law that I wish to highlight. First, among his central strategic moves was to establish concordance between the objectives of colonial law and the operative logics of Islamic jurisprudence. So for instance, remember Khan had argued, as I just showed, that even though cow sacrifice was not in essence a religious obligation in Islamic law, Muslims were not allowed to being pressured or coerced into abandoning this practice. This was so because succumbing to such coercion would bring shame and humiliation to the Muslim community, an outcome that could not be tolerated in Islamic law. Now Khan connected this pre-modern logic of Islamic jurisprudence to the modern colonial discourse on coercion. He claimed 
that the British should never allow the fracturing of a religious community's honor and freedom by tolerating its subjection to coercive subjugation. In effect, Khan stitched disparate yet intersecting threads in colonial and Islamic law to weave an overlapping normative argument. Second, in trying to demonstrate that precluding Muslims from the ritual of cow sacrifice constituted a breach of religious freedom, he first had to prove that this ritual was indeed holy and legitimately, quote unquote, religious. This he sought to do most often by citing numerous Quranic verses and Prophet Muhammad's sayings that establish cow sacrifice as among the distinguishing markers of Islam. For instance, the most prominent uh, such Quranic verse, which is verse 36 of chapter 22, reads as follows. And as for the sacrifice of cattle, we have ordained it for you as among the symbols of distinction designated by God. Similarly, in a prophetic report cited in all six canonical books of Hadith in Sunni Islam, the Prophet's youngest wife and prolific Hadith narrator, Aisha bint Abi Bakr, died 678, reported that the Prophet had sacrificed a cow on behalf of his wives. Khan's objective in mobilizing such discursive fragments from the tradition was to prove, as he put it, and I quote him here, that cow sacrifice is a religious ritual for Muslims normatively sanctioned by the Quran and the Prophet's normative model or the Sunnah. Now, having established the religious character of, of uh, cow sacrifice, Khan proceeded to remind colonial authorities of their duty to honor the principle of religious freedom, mazhabi azadi, in an even-handed manner that does not privilege the sensibilities of one group over those of another, as he pointedly pleaded, and I quote him again, does religious freedom mean that in affirming the position and priorities of one community, another is compelled to seize the performance of its critical religious rituals? End of quote. Now, Khan was by no means a liberal secular champion of religious freedom as a normative ideal. What we find here instead is a seemingly illiberal actor's strategic deployment of liberal desires and principles for the advancement of his own agenda. But this strategic deployment of the liberal ideal of religious freedom should not be read as an example of a Muslim scholar's exercise in native agency either, because ultimately he was drawn and conscripted into the task of contending with a set of conditions and categories like religious freedom that were not of his choosing or of his making. Nonetheless, Khan displayed remarkable adeptness at negotiating the political and institutional terrain of colonial rule in a manner most conducive to the integrity and successful execution of his normative project. So, for example, in among the most fascinating moves in this text, contrary to his broader argument, Khan stipulated that Indian Muslims should in fact refrain from cow sacrifice in those public places and spaces where the colonial government had outlawed this practice. They should not break the law or contribute to the incitement of disorder, he sternly advised. So was this a gesture of affirming and embracing the virtues and duties of a good liberal citizen? Not quite. Here again, Khan's position was leavened first and foremost by the logic and imperative of securing Islam's power and stature in the public sphere. Muslims should not contravene the law, he, reason, he reasoned, because getting punished or arrested as, as a result of doing so will bring insult and humiliation to Islam. In turn, this will elevate the position of Islam's rivals and enemies. Thus, curiously, in this instance, Khan's imperial Muslim political theology coalesced with the colonial regulation of the public sphere via the law. Also, Khan's equations to colonial law highlights that in addition to his apparently harsh and strict attitude on the issue of cow sacrifice, he was eminently capable of uh, acting with unabashed pragmatism. He was not a radical exclusivist unhinged from the limits and power, power equations of the world he inhabited. Rather, his exclusivism was carefully choreographed so as to deftly combine fidelity to the normative ideal of Muslim exceptionalism with a more pragmatic concern for negotiating the monstrosity of colonial power. But perhaps the most fascinating aspect of Khan's hermeneutic, with which I will conclude this segment of this talk, was his view on cow sacrifice in Hindu thought and practice. Donning the hat of a comparativist, Khan argued that the supposed sacrality attached to the cow was not part of, and I quote him here, the original religion of the Hindus, but was rather the invention of their moderns, end of quote. After all, he relished in pointing out, and I quote him, the sources of the Hindu tradition amply testify that their ancients were not deprived of the pleasures of beef. 
Moreover, he continued, it is also well established that figures like Ram, Krishna, and Lakshman took part in animal and cow hunting. Khan was particularly incensed by his opponents' claim that cow sacrifice was not, obligated, was not obligated in the Quran and that the normative emphasis on cow sacrifice was only a product of the later Islamic jurisprudential tradition or the fiqh. As a rejoinder, he not only marshaled evidence from the Quran and sayings of Prophet Muhammad that established cow sacrifice as among the markers of Muslim distinction, as I just cited. Further, he also questioned the logic of pressuring Muslims to find evidence justifying cow sacrifice in the Quran when the taboo against cow sacrifice in the Hindu tradition was derived not from the original Vedas, but the much later Shastras. In a telling instance of interreligious translation, Khan challenged his opponents and said, and I quote him here, if they're intellectually honest, they must prove the prohibition of cow sacrifice from the Vedas. And if they will base their religion on the Shastras, then, we must, then they must also accept Islamic jurisprudence in the several texts associated with the Hanafi school of law as an equally legitimate uh, foundation of our religion, end of quote. But while calling out his opponents for their scripturalist uh, bias, Khan proceeded to offer his own scripturalist line of attack by mining instances of animal and cow sacrifice in the Vedas. By doing so, he sketched a rise and fall narrative of Hindu thought and practice, whereby the purity of a Vedic golden age was ruined by later traditions and scholars. The profound irony of the intimate resemblance of this rise and fall narrative and position of Hindu, uh, the intimate, it's, I'll read again, the profound irony of the intimate resemblance of this rise and fall narrative to the position of Hindu reform movements contemporaneous to Khan, such as the Arya Samaj, that were at the forefront of the cow protection movement is all too obvious. Now, for the remainder of this talk, uh, I want to turn to key aspects of the position that Khan had so vigorously opposed, namely that Indian Muslims suspend cow sacrifice as a way to cultivate Hindu-Muslim harmony and a united political front to oppose British colonial power and through that salvage the Ottoman Caliphate. I will do so by focusing on the thought of arguably the most influential proponent and exponent of this view, Qayyamuddin Abdul Bari, a leading luminary of the prestigious Farangi Mahal School, an institution known for its curricular emphasis on logic, philosophy, and the rationalist disciplines. Uh, Bari was a prolific as well as a curious personality on the intellectual map of uh, modern South Asian Islam, who escapes any neat categorization. While a firm Hanafi traditionalist, he was also a driving force, indeed a leading protagonist of such otherwise modernist political enterprises as the Khilafat movement. This ability to traverse multiple ideological registers marks an important element of his intellectual makeup that also constitutes a crucial ingredient of his engagement with the cow question. Although he lived a relatively short life of 47 years from 1878 to 1926, he left behind a trail of intellectual output at once staggeringly voluminous and thematically diverse. Let me state at the outset uh, what I will show through the following analysis, which is based on uh, Bari's thought and discourses on cow sacrifice, uh, found in a number of his Urdu speeches, letters, and correspondences devoted to this problem, uh, ranging from late 1919 to most of uh, uh, 1920. What I will show is this, that Bari's views on the cow were a lot more nuanced than a blanket prohibition against its sacrifice. Moreover, and this point is crucial to my concerns, while arguing for a position of interreligious hospitality that pushed for abstention from cow sacrifice, Bari was always careful to frame his argument in and ensure its consistency with traditionalist Islamic legal protocols and parameters of moral argument. How did he seek to accomplish that? Let me explain. At the heart of Bari's approach to this issue was a call to de-intensify the communal attachments invested in the cow coaxing Indian Muslims into abandoning cow sacrifice in order to pave the way for Hindu-Muslim intimacy, he argued, would backfire and turn counterproductive. Instead, the process had to work the other way around. Hindu-Muslim relations had to be cemented to a point that the volatile sensitivities fueling the problem of cow sacrifice would gradually diffuse on their own. The more the cow was brought into focus as a contested issue, the more its sacrifice became a lightning rod for all concerned stakeholders. Deflating the heightened communal stakes invested in the cow was paramount to reducing its potentiality for stoking interreligious tensions and violence. All involved parties, he emphasized, had to play the role in executing this process. Indian Muslims, he suggested, 
could refrain from explicitly airing their attachment to cow sacrifice as a marker of faith. And it was best for the Hindu community, on the other hand, to not come across as obstinate on this issue and to drop their insistence on the abandonment of cow sacrifice. Over time, such tempering attitudes from the two communities will dissipate and eventually erase the controversy surrounding cow sacrifice, Bari postulated. In other words, retooling communal attitudes towards a problem presented a much smoother and more durable path to its resolution than that of applying the sledgehammer of law and legislation. Now, Bari was acutely aware that he must not be seen as normatively obligating Indian Muslims to give up cow sacrifice, lest that throw him in a pit of doctrinal landmines, as he adamantly pronounced, and I quote him here, I am not giving a fatwa or even a recommendation pushing people to abandon cow slaughter. I'm just offering my preliminary opinion with the view to foster Hindu-Muslim unity. Bari was also at pains to impress upon his readers that his position on refraining from cow sacrifice was not is issued under the pressure of Gandhi and the Indian National Congress, one of the central points of rebuke lobbied by opponents like Ahmad Raza Khan. I did, not abandon cow uh, I did not abandon cow slaughter on Gandhi's insistence. I did so on my own accord after much thought and deliberation and out of consideration for public welfare. He defiantly clarified. In fact, he went a step further to proclaim, had Gandhi asked me to give up cow sacrifice, I would absolutely never have done so. But what public welfare, might one ask, was derived from abandoning cow sacrifice? Pari's response to this question was curious. It sought to invert the very category of distinguishing markers of Islam, sha'ir islam that I've been uh, talking about frequently here. He inverted that very category that his opponents had mobilized against him in his own favor. How? He argued that the promise of Hindu-Muslim unity offered through the Muslim cessation of cow sacrifice represented a necessary political ingredient for resisting British colonial power and thus for saving the Ottoman Caliphate. And the Caliphate, he continued his argument, constituted a much more significant and sacred marker of Muslim distinction than did cow sacrifice. As he bluntly put it, and I quote him, what is the cow when put next to the Caliphate? In a fascinating move, Bari did not contest or try to refute his opponent's claim that cow sacrifice indeed represented an important marker of Muslim distinction in the public sphere in the South Asian context. He readily admitted that yes, it was so. Moreover, he was also in complete agreement with the likes of Ahmad Raza Khan that Indian Muslims must not abandon cow sacrifice under the coercion or pressure of Hindus and their leaders like Gandhi. Instead, he framed his program for forging Hindu-Muslim unity as what he intriguingly termed an exception to the norm, kharqul ada, whereby a marker of Muslim distinction, that of cow sacrifice, was, so to say, its self-sacrificed to safeguard a much more vital and coveted marker of Muslim distinction, the caliphate. In essence, Bari packaged the cultivation of Hindu-Muslim harmony as a departure from the norm necessitated by a moment of politico-theological tribulation for the Muslim community, with the caliphate under grave threat. And by doing so, he astutely maintained his normative loyalty to the principle of Muslim exceptionalism, while also justifying the temporary exception of Hindu-Muslim friendship precipitated by political necessity. Abdul Bari's attempt to convince Indian Muslims that they refrained from cow sacrifice was not free from ambiguities, of course. The most glaring such ambiguity was reflected in the following question. How was one to determine whether such refrain represented one's own decision or was a product of external pressure or coercion? What differentiated decision from coercion? And how was that to be decided? Uh, Bari left this question unaddressed. But as to his own practice on the question of cow sacrifice, he left little ambiguity. In a letter penned in August of 1920, he explicitly declared, and I quote him, I will not sacrifice cows during the next Eid al-Adha, uh, Eid al-Adha, and it is my desire that other Muslims also imitate me in this practice of abstention, end of quote. So to conclude, I have tried to make uh, two main arguments today. One, I have tried to show that for certain preeminent Muslim scholars in colonial South Asia, the body of the cow was a site of both immense anxiety as well as possibility. The cow represented a discursive field that inhabited a variety of conflicting normative projects and desires. On the one hand, for the likes of Ahmad Raza Khan, the ideal of Muslim dominance or the threat of humiliation was firmly tethered 
to the public performance of rituals and practices that marked the distinction of Indian Muslims over competing others. It was not the curation of a Muslim state, but rather the curation and regulation of a moral Muslim public that occupied his political energies. More specifically in Khan's thought, the promise of sovereign power and decision for an, for an imagined Indian Muslim community depended on and was made possible by the sacrifice and erasure of the bovine body. Put more simply, the gift of a sovereign Muslim life was inextricably entwined to the death of the cow. On the other hand, for Malvi Abdul Bari and his Khilafat movement uh, colleagues, the cow was equally important for it contained the promise of an inter-religious alliance and friendship necessary for Muslim political survival. Notice that much like his rival Khan, Bari also considered the cow pregnant with power. Though for him, power was enshrined in the imperative of restoring a coveted marker of Muslim political sovereignty, the institution of the caliphate. While maintaining Muslim dominance in the public performance of ritual practice was important, its significance paled in comparison to the caliphate's aura and sacrality. Thus, what I've tried to show is that embedded and enshrined in the views of these scholars on the cow were two competing understandings of power and politics in the aftermath of Muslim political sovereignty in South Asia. And second, I've tried to show and argue that Khan's and Bari's discourses on the cow evince a complex and conflictual negotiation of the logics and aspirations of Islamic law, especially as couched in its pre-modern context of, of Muslim empire and the generative conditions and structures of colonial power. I would like to suggest in closing that the terms and texture of this interplay were far too complicated to render tenable the temptation of approaching the normative projects through attractive yet distorting binaries like traditional, modern, liberal, illiberal, inclusive, exclusive, etc. Such binaries can hardly attend to the vexing tensions and aspirations hovering over critical moments of South Asian Muslim intellectual thought, like Khan's and Bari's rival yet often converging views on cow sacrifice and the limits and promise of Hindu-Muslim friendship. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for a lovely talk. Um, so let's turn now um, to Professor Shudipto Kamaraj, and uh, who will um, has has had a chance to see it in advance. So um, we really look forward to hearing um, what you have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Tarin, for presenting this paper. I thought it's a wonderful paper. I'll tell you in a minute, you know, what I particularly appreciated in this. In this. And also to Kathy for asking me to comment on it, because I learned a lot. I also learned to see certain things which are methodologically very significant in doing South Asian intellectual history. So I will make four or five points. Um, most of these points will be uh, you know, points of uh, theory, some of political theory, but I hope uh, these would not be irrelevant to the discussion. And I wouldn't go on for very long to leave it in the hands of people who know the uh, subject uh, very well. Um, the first thing that I found very interesting about the paper was its treatment of the public sphere. It's not a, it's not a central concern of the paper, but I'm uh, asking you this question because it could be that somewhere else in your book <coughs> you are dealing with this uh, problem. Uh, I think our discussion about the public sphere of discussion is sometimes distorted by accepting too much, you know, and without uh, criticism, a kind of simple, flat Habermasian understanding of the public sphere. And the most important thing in our case is not to say that Habermas's work is not important. Of course, it's very important. But I think we would benefit more, and I think your work is very rich in that, is to show uh, what are the modalities of the public sphere being common? 
which are different from the kind of public sphere that you get in uh, Habermas. And the paper, I think, helps us understand these differences very clearly. In India, sociological diversity is generally linked to linguistic diversity. Identities are linked to languages. And I think what I found very striking in your uh, paper was the idea that the Islamic public sphere has two parts. Not identically, but in some ways, it's also similar to the Bengali public sphere that I looked at when I worked on Bokeh. It has an internal side where Muslims discuss with Muslims in a language which is peculiar to that internal public sphere. But at the same time, they're doing this next to and also inside, in a sense, an external public sphere where Muslims discuss things with others, with the Hindus and the British, etc. And I think what your paper has done is actually to lift the screen in a certain sense from over the internal side of the Muslim public sphere, which people like us who read about it in history written in English language, academic history, cannot go into the text themselves, cannot understand. It. So I wanted to thank you very strongly for being able to do that. I have uh, another point, which I, again, this is something which I find done very with skill in your paper, but I wish you uh, would do it uh, more explicitly. You know, the whole point of doing the methodological problem of doing intellectual history of this period is to find a way in which we can rescue the older language you know, from a kind of overwhelming translation into the invisible ubiquity of the modern language. That you know, there's a difference between Hindus and Muslims, which articulates itself in an in a in a traditional language. But when we write a history, we actually translate that in a certain sense into the modern language of the conflict between Hindus and Muslims, right? Which flattens it, which distorts it in some way. But the important thing is that you know, without the skill that you have of not really knowing the language well not merely knowing the natural language well, you know, Urdu or Persian or whatever, but also knowing the conceptual language well, you know, people cannot do that. So that's the first thing which I appreciated very much in your presentation. I have one small remark about that, but again, this is something which probably you have tackled in another part of your work. You know, uh, I'm always struck when I'm, because I study political theory, with one aspect of the problem of language, you know, which is the language of, which is the question of tone. Uh, Frege makes a distinction between sense and tone, where he says, you know, sense is anything which pertains to meaning. Tone is everything which is, does not pertain to meaning. But because we are concerned, just as I'm concerned in writing about Bengali, you are concerned in writing about Urdu, uh, about a public sphere where these people are not really doing an intellectual exercise in disputation about you know, highly important, but also sometimes highly arcane matters. They're also doing it to an audience, which is all, not always a reading audience. You know, the sphere that we conceive of, uh, opposed to Habermas, you know, is a sphere which must have many different concentric circles. You know, there's an umbra in which the disputation is going on. But there are several penumbras behind, beyond that, you know, of people reading, people reading inattentively, people who are getting the effect of this disputation secondhand, uh, you know, uh, other discussions actually circulating, et cetera. So in that, I think the question of tone would be interesting. And uh, you mentioned about both these uh, writers, you know, they are very powerful writers. So um, I had a question about the tone. I have two general points about the question of the theory that is involved in your uh, paper. First, I have a remark about the question of sovereignty. I think in your paper, sovereignty is rather loosely defined as political power. Uh, you are defining it that way. I think your authors are also partly defining it that way. For instance, when Ahmed Reza Khan talks about sovereignty, I do not know what term he uses, sovereignty. It is a kind of generic dominance of a power which is seen as Muslim and imperial. 
I personally feel that, you know, sometimes in this, you could think of something which is important in general discussions in political theory, where people like me would argue that if you take the term sovereignty in the sense of modern political theory, in a very technical sense, you know, Austin's definition of sovereignty, or something like that, then either we have to say that the previous imperial authority was not sovereign, I have sometimes called it states of subsidiarity rather than sovereignty, or uh, I think we need not go into that. We could say that, you know, there are two forms of sovereignty. One is the modern form of, form of sovereignty, which makes much greater and much more comprehensive demand of, uh, of it, what it can do to the society. And an earlier imperial form of sovereignty, whose demand of dominance over the society, I think, is much more restrained. So this is one thing which uh, struck me. Um, And <clears throat> it might also be linked to something else, that in the Mughal conception of religious diversity and the colonial conception of religious freedom, this is partly reflected in uh, Ahmed Riza Khan's work. Because what I found very striking is how adept he is in selectively using certain elements of, from the modern language, uh, which we can, uh, can call broadly liberal language. But I think major difference would be that the first is uh, it thinks of religious diversity as relationship between two communities and groups. And the second is actually much more focused on the individual subject in which the earlier conception was not. Because in that world, the conception of an individual subject in the modern sense you know, did not exist. Secondly, uh, what I found very interesting, not so surprising, but here also the question of the subject is interesting. Uh, in Abdul Bari's uh, discussion about the relation with the Hindus, I was very struck by the similarity that you uh, that I found with, let's say, the argument in Bhude Mukhopadhyay to some extent Gandhi, where the striking similarity is that they are not trying to make that argument by saying, uh, by linking it to a rigorous use of a language of rights, but avoiding the language of rights, um, you know, bypassing the language of rights into a language of friendship, friendship, hospitality, etc. Uh, Uday Mehta has written about that very uh, evocatively about Gandhi, how he wants to get away from the uh, liberal language of French, uh, liberal language of rights, into an argument about friendship. So I think that you know that is. You have also shown that very, very well, very interestingly. And uh, I think it would be interesting to make, it would be important for people like us to make a demand on you, because you know the subject well, and you know the text very well, that you should show us a little bit more in the sense that you, you have shown us the structure of the arguments of two important people on a particular question. Right. So it is like, let's say, uh, should people be given uh, welfare by the state? And uh, a conservative has one position and uh, a liberal has a different position. But I think it would be wonderful if you could show us a little bit more you know, about the lineaments of the languages, you know, the conceptual languages through which they're constructing this. It is linked to the earlier point, but I thought, uh, we could say that you know people like you um, should do that, and it would give us a clearer understanding of uh, you know what is going on uh, in their discussion. Uh, it is also quite, I found it very interesting. You pointed out, but I also found it quite interesting how uh, Ahmed Reza Khan is using the question of sovereignty. Uh, he is analytic about the question of sovereignty in some point. In some points, there's a very clear, you know, reminder for the question of sovereignty. So, if you could go into that, uh, that would probably enrich your paper. Um, finally, uh, I have um, a very small remark uh, about the very last part of your paper, where you talk about, uh, you know, critical animal uh, theory, etc. 
And I was pleased that you do not give in to this idea that you know, any idea which is worthwhile must have originated in the modern American academia. And, uh, but I think it raises an interesting question. You know, the, to put it rather facetiously, one could say, so for instance, in the Hindu discussion, very often on widow, uh, lives of widows, widows, the marriage, et cetera, you get a situation where people would, uh, some people would say that, you know, uh, I understand all these arguments, but what about asking the widows about what they think about this situation? <laughs> but I say, I like the point that you make, which should be made seriously, that, uh, and I find it quite, an, I had a question to you that, uh, given the experience I have had of uh, being part of research on Islamic political thought by a lot of our students, you know, so here, uh, many other students were uh, worked on that. Um, I wonder whether there is an argument that you get in, let's say, the Buddhists and the Advaitins, etc., about a cosmic order in which human beings are only a part, probably not the most important part, where, you know, there are other parts which are equally integral. Now, the Buddhists would emphasize the place of the sentient in that order. The Advait Advaitic philosophers, I think, make an argument which I find purely from the point of view of technical philosophy more radical. They would say that even the intention you know, has a part of that uh, idea of the cosmic order as a complex living whole. So for the whole to be uh, complexly living, it does not require that every part of that whole must be living. So, which actually accord uh, not only the sension, but also the insension, a certain kind of part in our world where we use the term our, you know, not casually, but in a, in a much more philosophically full term. But uh, the question to you then would be that, you know, uh, these are three humans. Uh, conception, in the sense that these are conceptions which had no idea about what modernity, the rise of modern technology, uh, when it works with capitalism as an economic system, can do to the world as a whole. So therefore, somebody can ask you a question that can pre-humanist thought deal with this kind of devastation, or can pre-humanist thought, would pre-humanist thought be limited only to lament? And so, therefore, if you want to go beyond that, you have to draw from, you know, this post-humanist theoretical tradition. And uh, so, these are my remarks. I just wanted to make one final point, uh, which is partly a kind of request to you and to other scholars in your field. Um, Islamic thinking, I sometimes feel, is flattened, and uh, the Peculiarity of Islamic thought in South Asia is not always taken out, you know, and shown in its full richness. I mean by richness something else, you know. Uh, I mean by richness not philosophical richness or not logical richness, richness of content. I mean by richness of content something else. You know, Islam must exist dually in the world. It exists securely, in a sense, in a sense, in a world which is predominantly wholly Islamic in the Middle East, in North Africa, even in Iran. But Islam also lives, uh, exists in a world where it is next to other traditions, which also have highly developed traditions of thought. And I think Indian Islam is very interesting because of this, that it has actually a peculiar history of living next to traditions like uh, the Hindu tradition, the Buddhists, etc., et which are very different, which have highly developed philosophical traditions. And so therefore, I think what I find very interesting in the work that you are doing, and this encompasses in a very strange sense, both your authors. You know, both your authors are actually doing something which somebody who is living in Saudi Arabia, for instance, would not have to do. They are uh, contending with the world which is much more intellectually complex, you know, much more intellectually diverse than the world of, uh, in a certain sense, 
you know, the central the center of Islam. So that's why I found this very, very interesting. So thank you very much for writing this and thank you, Kathy, for allowing to read it before the presentation. Well, thank you very much for your um, really thoughtful comments here. And um, I think now I, I, maybe I should um, give you some time to respond, Shirley. I'll be, I'll yes. be brief, but uh, th thank yeah. you so much, uh, uh, Professor Kaviraj, for those really, really uh, enlightening, uh, um, uh, excellent and really useful uh, comments as well. I, I'm uh, so honored uh, by the kind of time and the close reading that you have devoted uh, to this chapter and it's uh, extremely helpful uh, to hear you um, uh, talk about it uh, thank you so much i'll maybe pick a couple of uh, themes broad themes that professor kaviraj has talked about and uh, just speak briefly about them um he is ab absolutely correct uh, with this idea of the islamic public sphere having two parts an internal side in which you have this intra-muslim contestation and then the uh, negotiation with the so-called external other and that precisely is the kind of larger argument I'm developing in this book, which is that oftentimes these um, contestations over the question of Hindu-Muslim friendship have a lot more to do with thorny, unresolved questions of intra-Muslim debates and contestation uh, that then cannot be canonized or collapsed into uh, 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 framings like modernism and traditionalism, even though there are certain aspects of modernist and traditionalist logics at work there, that there are these complexities of thought involved in this question of Hindu-Muslim friendship that uh, are representative of these internal, uh, intra-Muslim uh, unresolved uh, questions of law, theology, ethics, and so on. Um, and you're absolutely correct about the question of uh, uh, the public sphere. And, and primarily, I am trying to think about this question of, you know, the ways in which everyday life and practice becomes uh, a linchpin of, uh, of po power and politics. Uh, and increasingly, one, one sees in the, in the archive that there is a tremendous investment in these questions of everyday practice, uh, you know, Muslim ritual practice, which is not, of course, an invention of the late 18th or 19th or 20th centuries. But one does see this investment, the kind of heightened anxiety over preserving a Muslim identity and purity in the public sphere through everyday ritual practices is much more intensified come the late 18th and 19th century than uh, previously. So why is that the case? And the kind of working theory I'm developing here is that precisely it is a reflection of seeking to exercise some form of power by uh, establishing distinction with the non-Muslim other and through that exercising some notion of sovereign power given that Muslim political sovereignty is no longer a viable option. So I'm trying to think about ways in which the intensification of the everyday uh, as a site of power and politics, in fact, expands the notion of sovereignty beyond the confines of the modern state. So in some ways, this kind of an illiberal notion of power and politics, in fact, might paradoxically help us think about sovereignty beyond the confines or beyond the limits of uh, modern state sovereignty and its different forms of exception. So that's how it connects to your larger question about sovereignty also, which is extremely useful. Uh, and and, and uh, precisely the distinction that you've also made between sub subsidiarity and, and modern state sovereignty is, is precisely at work in these, in these contestations as well. Um, I just want to make a quick brief comment about this very interesting uh, comment you made, a very productive one as well, about the whole question of uh, someone like Abdul Bari uh, thinking about uh, friendship and hospitality beyond the contractual language of the relationship between the state and the citizen, and the kind of resemblance that has to a certain kind of non-contractual notions of friendship uh, articulated in the thought of Gandhi and others. Uh, precisely, there is that resemblance, and that precisely is the kind of non-contractual notion of friendship and hospitality that irks and uh, makes anxious a scholar like Ahmad Raza Khan, because his main position uh, in his debates with other Khilafat movement uh, scholars like Abul Kalam Azad, which is a chapter before this one, is precisely that one has to make a distinction between substantive friendship or intimacy with, with a, with a non-Muslim community, whether that is the British or the Hindus, and mere transactional relations. So the whole debate that erupts here has to do with can Muslim institutions of learning, schools and colleges, accept financial aid from the British colonial state? And Abul Kalam Azad and his Khilafat movement colleagues issue a fatwa saying that you cannot take financial aid. And that really irks someone like Ahmad Raza Khan by saying that you have to maintain that contractual relationship and not let that pass into substantive intimacy or friendship. 
So one has to make this distinction between friendship on the one hand, the Arabic sort of term there is mu'alat for friendship, and mere transactional relations or what is called mujarrad mu'amalat. You have to keep the transactions in place, but not uh, let that slip into friendship. So that precisely is the question of how do you distinguish between a, a language of contract and a language that sort of supersedes a colonial language of contract to think about hospitality and friendship in other uh, different words. Um, your, your point about uh, showing the lineaments of the conceptual languages through, these, uh, through which these arguments are made is very well taken, uh, very useful, uh, something that I look forward to um, uh, thinking more about and executing in, in the writing. Uh, and the larger sort of uh, question about post-humanism and its relationship to these kinds of archives is, of course, a much uh, larger question. Um, there again, I, I, I want to maintain the specificity of these logics uh, at work here, but, but it is curious to think about ways in which the cow, for example, in this debate is precisely the arena or the site on which two competing notions of the political are being, are being uh, contested, but the very materiality of the cow or the body of the cow is in some ways quite muted. So what does it make of that, that, that sort of uh, hierarchy, uh, the kind of uh, humanist hierarchy that we see in place uh, in this kind of an archive? Um, so uh, there's much more to chew on here, but thank you so much. And this is extremely helpful, useful, and a true privilege and honor. Thank you so much, Professor Kaviraj. OK, great. Thanks. Now, um, I, we have one question already, but I would ask other people to um, use the raise hand function. Um, that brings you up to the to the front of my screen and I'll, I'll see you. Otherwise, I, I won't necessarily see you. Um, and so our first um, question is from Soheb Khan. Uh, so Soheb, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Tareen, for this um, fascinating talk. I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, I haven't read the paper, but, you know, as I was listening to your talk, I could imagine this could be easily converted into a play, you know, to be, you know, shown at a theater with, you know, the fascinating characters and, you know, the discussions and the debates. So it was, it was wonderful. I, um, I have a question about uh, the contemporary relevance or perhaps the normative implications that might stem from this paper, uh, especially when one looks at, you know, Hindutva and the insistence on, you know, the ban of cows, cow slaughter. I, I find very uh, admirable um, uh, your uh, epistemic humility and your refusal to uh, put either Khan or Abdul Bari in the religious obscurantism versus secular tolerance camp. And you're, you're showing that, you know, it's, it's a very complicated picture over here. Uh, Ahmed Raza Khan uh, wants Muslims to sacrifice cows, but he's also strategically using an argument from religious freedom. Abdul Bari, on the other hand, is talking about interreligious tolerance, but he's subordinating that tolerance to a higher goal of, you know, imperial Muslim sovereignty or whatever. So it's, it's very hard to, you know, categorize them in this manner. But if someone were to read your work and they would try to understand um, you know, what, what's, what's happening with the, uh, you know, Hindutva nowadays and how does one explain the, you know, the, you know, the forms of, uh, uh, uh religious bigotry. And of course they might be, and Professor Kaviraj can correct me if I'm wrong, the Hindutva would also always constantly use secular arguments and secular modes of reasoning. So clearly the secular religious binary is not helpful to understand what's happening in South Asia. But what could be some of the normative implications uh, of your work if you want to understand, you know, interreligious, uh, or if you want to aspire towards a form of interreligious harmony in South Asia today? Thank you very much, Soib, for that very interesting uh, uh, question. Um, so I, the way I will answer your question is this: uh, to talk about the implications or the relevance of this debate a hundred years later. Uh, I want to narrate uh, an episode with which I end the book, in fact, the epilogue, which is that two years ago, in fact, just around this time, January of 2020, um, you know, Sharjil Imam, who uh, many of us, of course, know, this uh, very outspoken uh, student at JNU, graduate student who lead, led, of course, the anti-NRC, um, uh, CA protests, um, and of course, I think is still imprisoned now on prison charges, etc., um, he gives a speech, uh, uh, I believe, at AMU, uh, in which he talks about a number of different things. It's around a 15-minute speech. And towards the end of that speech, he, in fact, talks about this very debate. Uh, and, in fact, he mentions Ahmad Raza Khan and Abul Kalam Azad. He does not really talk about Malik Abdul Bari much, but Abul Kalam Azad. And he talks about this very text that I just analyzed at a close reading of. 
And his argument was quite interesting. And his talk and his speech, of course, was uh, not only uh, focused on this topic, but a certain kind of a critique, not just on uh, sort of a Hindu nationalist uh, right, but also on different varieties of, uh, of uh, sort of a, a liberal sort of elite of contemporary India. But he, makes, he made the argument citing this very text in the end last 15 minutes of that speech, that it is precisely people like Abul Kalam Azad, who in their good intentions, perhaps, who perhaps had good intentions in terms of forging some kind of a collaboration with Gandhi, et cetera, uh, who paved the grounds for precisely things like uh, cow sacrifice being seen as taboo or uh, for Muslims to have come under this kind of pressure and paved the ground for the eventual acceleration of a Hindu majoritarian violence on this very question of cow sacrifice. So his argument was that they may have had good intentions of forging some kind of Hindu-Muslim collaboration to save the Ottoman Caliphate, that, but that's precisely the kind of uh, logics that eventually paved the way for a certain kind of a nefarious Hindu nationalist uh, violence. And his other argument was that why are we not taught the thought of Ahmad Raza Khan in our curriculum, in our school books? Why do we know so much about Abul Kalam Azad, the sort of sometimes at times, at times perhaps simplified sort of uh, a banner bearer of a certain kind of Hindu-Muslim unity, et cetera, and sort of some, some kind of a secular outlook. Uh, but why are we not uh, uh, you know, uh, taught and uh, made to learn about views like Ahmad Raza Khan's and this particular text, for example, on Fusul Fikr, Qurban al-Bakr, which is an interesting point. I mean, regardless of what you make with that, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, uh, that shows a certain kind of very contemporary relevance of these intra-Muslim debates and how they're seen 100 years later in the context of recent protests and how this question of uh, cow sacrifice and different notions of Hindu-Muslim unity or otherwise uh, uh, come in the public sphere in unexpected ways. So that's how I would answer your question. I mean, the afterlife of this particular debate is that, you know, opponents of Ahmad Raza Khan pave, uh, paint him as being pro-British, as being sort of, uh, you know, um, okay with uh, uh, having a, a friendship with the British, although his argument was a bit more nuanced than that. So it gets into the grind of nationalist politics in terms of some people championing him as someone who, you know, ensured uh, uh, Muslim purity uh, uh, and others, of course, uh, uh, painting him as a pro-British agent and both, of course, are uh, caricatures. But that in some ways, uh, I can't answer your second part of your question of how to, I guess, I, let, let, let me take a stab. I think in terms of thinking about a notion of interreligious hospitality uh, that is more durable, one has to have some kind of an ethic of double critique that refuses both the inheritance of pathological inheritances of Muslim imperial political theologies while engaging in an analysis of it and not completely discrediting it, but a close analysis of it, but, but refusing that kind of inheritance. And at the same time, being very critical and being very suspicious of modern liberal and modern state projects of uh, tolerance and the management and regulation of majority minority relations. Some kind of a notion of double critique that would offer in a, a, a new horizon of uh, thinking about interreligious relations that uh, is neither imperiled by uh, modern state sovereignty and secular power, but is uh, also not uh, 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 animated by the uh, fantastic promise of an imperial political theology in the contemporary moment. That's briefly what I would say in response to that. Okay, great. Um, oh, we have two people up. Um... First, Fran Pritchett, and then David Bellyball. Thank you, Cher Ali. That was lovely. And it was so rigorously argued. And you presented it so elegantly and eloquently. And it very much resembled a debate. And yet, you also emphasized the fact that it was about the bodies of cows and the symbolic uses of the bodies of cows. And that led me to wonder. Um, not, not so much Suheb's question about what's going on a uh, hundred years later, but in the immediate time frame, um, what response did this did did Hindu writers have things to say about the, on this subject um, that that were relevant, or did did was there any change in patterns of cow sacrifice or cow slaughter or? or cow treatment, you know, is there a way to measure an audience yeah. response or an effect in the real world? I know this is not what your paper is, is sure. about, but I'm just curious because of the, the interestingly close yet symbolic relationship between the abstract idea of the cow and the actual animals. But anyway, thank you for, for a lovely presentation.
thank you, Professor Pritchard, for that excellent question and uh, for your time. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's an excellent question and one that I uh, will not be able to satisfact, uh, satisfactorily answer, uh, to be very on honest, to be very honest, because that's not sort of my focus, the kind of social history enveloping these arguments, which of course is a very important, I think, uh, topic of interest. What I can say is, what I can say is that in terms of the kind of questions that these scholars and others receive on this particular question, one can clearly tell that interestingly, the, the, the fatwa that I analyzed of Ahmad Raza Khan was written in 1880. So it, that's quite early, in fact. So this is, and the Khilafat movement and these old debates, of course, are more in 1919, 20. So we can see this kind of a 40 year time period in which this question is pulsating in the public sphere. Uh, you have increasing amounts of Muslim litigants uh, who, of course, take this question of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, not uh, having cow sacrifice being banned in public spaces in different high courts uh, and so on, which is shown by Rohit Day in his uh, book uh, uh, and a specific chapter that he has on the cow question. Uh, I also look at some other sort of uh, riots, uh, the ways in which they were recorded by uh, the British authorities uh, in Rangoon, in different parts of North India and elsewhere. Um, so one can clearly tell that this is a question that attracts tremendous investment on the ground. Clearly there is different sorts of uh, legal uh, litigation that is happening. There is uh, different kinds of uh, violence that erupts every now and then. And there are questioners who send questions to these kinds of scholars on this particular kind of ethical question. Now, the degree of the, the, uh, the debate and what exactly is the empirical sort of conditions on the ground, that will be a bit difficult for me to tell. But the, these glimpses that I get in the, in the textual archive that I, that I have studied suggest that it was very much a question pulsating uh, in at least the North Indian public sphere, if not beyond. Hey, David. Well, thank you, Sher Ali, for a brilliantly uh, rigorous uh, presentation. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you have become one of the leading intellectual historians of uh, Islam in South Asia, and I very much appreciate your work. Um, I want to uh, follow up uh, what Shadipta was suggesting about looking at the wider context and uh, in a way it's unfair to you because that's not what you presented. But uh, uh, one thing uh, that strikes me is uh, the defensive nature that uh, actually the whole issue was raised back in the 1870s in the beginnings of the cow slaughter, anti-cow slaughter uh, movement. Um, it, uh, it's not that it was unknown in the, in the past. Uh, there are moments in the time of Akbar when the, the issue of cow slaughter comes up, but uh, this becomes a uh, political issue to which Muslims have to respond. And of course, uh, uh, this is in the context, as you mentioned, of British rule. British also ate beef uh, uh, in a big way. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the defensive role of, uh, of uh, why does this issue come up and why is it so important? Uh, and that has to do with the general issue of why um, the nature of dietary rules in general in defining group identities die, die in in much in very complex ways in different uh, uh, within south asia and and so on the dietary rules are an important marker of uh, uh, identity and of course outside of india in the origins of the dietary rules of islam uh, uh, when people try to explain why uh, Jews do not mix milk and meat, um, which is not in Islam, um, uh, the, uh, one of the arguments is but that's because that's what the, the, the other people did. The Phoenicians or the, or, or the Canaanites uh, mixed milk and meat. And so it was a marker of difference. Um, so that, uh, I think that part of uh, Boundary making and defensiveness is uh, is something that I see as very important. Another question that uh, I, uh, occurs to me uh, in this larger social framework is um, the role of the ulama in the absence of uh, 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 Muslim rulership. And uh, here we have a distinction between the Farangi Mahal, 
which have, of course, had a long uh, history of uh, uh, relationship to uh, state power, uh, going back before uh, uh, British British rule and the training of people in at the Farangi Mahel, including, by the way, non-Muslims um, in uh, uh, Islamic law, in logic, in all of those practical uh, uh, parts of. Uh, um, uh, Makulat, uh, that, that was the specialty uh, of the rational sciences of, of, of Islam. Um, and that's quite different from uh, uh, Ahmed Reza Khan and the tradition that, that, that he came out. But we, uh, there is here an, an effort to uh, advance uh, a claim to leadership. And of course, there were non ulama who were <laughs> extremely important in uh, uh, leadership, and then the boundaries, of course, of Sufi and uh, and uh, and so on. But I mean, we're talking about the 1920s. Uh, we already have uh, uh, the Ali brothers, and we have Jinnah and, and and so on coming on the scene, um, who all offer an alternative um, leadership of Islam, maybe parallel in some respects to uh, uh, the non-ulama leadership that existed when there was Muslim rule. Well, thank you. Two, two uh, both very excellent points uh, on the question of food and identity, of course. That's absolutely central. And um, I think this question of defensiveness precisely is this question of it's a working hypothesis that I've been working with for a while now that I think there is this question of precisely questions of diet and the, the everyday choreography around the body uh, becomes critical as a synecdoche for a larger conception of Muslim political power. That in fact, in fact, the loss of Muslim political sovereignty makes possible and available this kind of intra-Muslim contestation. Um, so that is the sort of paradoxical effect here that in some ways, it is a desire for sovereign certainty in a moment of seeming crisis where power is no longer available in terms of state power that makes these kinds of debates possible. But on the other hand, it is precisely the absence of, I think, a Muslim political sovereign that allows for this proliferation of intra-Muslim contest on these questions of everyday life and practice. Um, uh, and someone like Bari and Abul Kalam Azad and others have an interesting alternative to this notion of locating power in ritual life and that for them it's really the institution of the caliphate and the resurrection of some notion of muslim political sovereignty that they uh, that they hold very dear the, the interesting thing there of course is that their whole argument of course of the khilafat movement was never that indian muslims should be under the political sovereignty of the ottoman caliphate that the the whole project of resurrecting the boundaries of the ottoman caliphate was integral to a much more nationalist notion of bringing Muslims together around this internationalist cause. So that's the interesting irony here, that this whole project is not, in fact, to be under the suzerainty or under the sovereignty of the Ottoman Caliphate, um, which is interesting because when the Ottoman Caliphate dissolves, different people within the Khilafat movement take on different stances in terms of their intimacy with Jinnah or this question of what do we do with the Wahhabis now? And that's where someone like Abdul Bari clearly differs, in fact, from Abul Kalam Azad. Uh, on this question of what do you do with Wahhabi power in, um, in uh, that part of the world. But, um, uh, but anyways, yeah, I think that first point is very well taken, um, uh, as uh, is the second one about these competing genealogies of reform that we see in this, reflected in this debate. Um, the slight contrast here between, say, someone like Abul Kalam Azad and other members of the Khilafat movement and someone like Abdul Bari is, that Abul Kalam Azad, although he had traditionalist education, very familiar with traditionalist norms of knowledge, when he makes a case for the caliphate and the necessity of the caliphate to the Sharia, on which the previous chapter of mine focuses, he cites pre-modern luminaries extensively with much depth and with much intellectual rigor, from Ghazali to Al-Baqilani and many, many others. He really goes into the galaxy of pre-modern Islam quite, quite rigorously. But he's quite comfortable subverting the authority of the traditionalist ulama and saying that there are new occupants to the uh, question of uh, how to interpret the question of caliphate and uh, politics, etc. Um, so he's quite comfortable in terms of subverting these checkpoints of Muslim traditionalism, whereas Abdul Bari is perhaps much more careful about navigating those landmines and making an argument which would uh, 
which would satisfy certain kinds of uh, protocols of uh, pre-modern Islamic jurisprudence. So there is that very subtle difference between a Bari and an Azad, which shows the kind of internal diversity within the Khilafat movement that I'm also trying to show. And ultimately, the whole project is trying to show the internal complexities and diversity uh, within this landscape of ulama traditions in modern South Asia. Thank you so much. David. We have um, other questions. Yes, uh, Anna. Hi, Anna Bigelow. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. It's nice to be back at Columbia, sort of. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So that was really just a delight to hear. And it makes me want to go back into my files and see if I can find out when precisely it was in Maler Kotla that they banned both beef and swine slaughter um, as part of the kingdom and whether that was had any, perhaps any connections with some of these moments of that you're pointing out, because um, that also, I think, presents an interesting case of sort of dual efforts at using slaughter and eating practices um, and as a mark of a bonding between um, uh, Sikh and, and um, Muslim communities. Um, but the question that I had for you was um, actually more about Body's thought on, so if when he's saying that it is the, the justification for engaging in, for, you know, not not declining to, to slaughter cattle is in order to maintain the strategic friendship. Does he also then go into what are what is the um, basis, sort of a thicky basis for that strategic friendship for a goal that's actually not potentially in Hindu interests or in other in non-Muslim interests in the region? Um, so, it, and does that is that distinct from Azad's logics along the same lines? Um, I don't know if that's a, a part of the bigger project, but I'm curious about that. Uh, terrific question, Anna. So. Um... So yes, so on that particular question, there is agreement between him and someone like Abul Kalam Azad. And the argument that they make, drawing from pre-modern scholars like Al-Ghazali, is that Muslim political sovereignty and the caliphate, if it is at all available, is a precondition for Muslim normative practices, even praying, fasting, etc. Uh, I mean, if the caliphate was unavailable and, 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 and not possible, then of course you aspire for it. But, but for example, the, uh, the analogy that Azad draws on, and I think Bari would agree with it, is that the caliphate is the root of the Sharia and the normative practices like praying, fasting, going for pilgrimage are its branches. So in some ways, political power and sovereignty precedes ritual practice. The very meaning and the very uh, potency and the very efficaciousness of ritual practices would be lost in the absence of Muslim caliphal power if it was at all uh, available, uh, its restoration was at all available. So the argument then is that even if we use this very category of markers of Muslim distinction, and if we even are uh, uh, invested in preserving Muslim rituals in the public sphere, that would only be possible if one aspires for Muslim caliphal power. The interesting thing, of course, is that that caliphal power is being located not in South Asia, but elsewhere. Um, that, of course, is the interesting sort of difference there. And the other interesting difference uh, and the other uh, ambiguity in terms of Muslim traditionalism is that, of course, in the Hanafi school of law, most scholars would agree that in order to be called uh, uh, the uh, caliph of the time, you need to have the lineage of the prophet uh, of his tribe, the Quraysh tribe, which, of course, the Ottomans lack. So that, of course, is a point and a weak point on which people like Ahmad Raza Khan and others pounce on, to which then um, Abul Kalam Azad and Abul Bari would respond by saying, most caliphates in Muslim history have not had, uh, a lot of them have not had uh, the lineage of the Quraysh. Uh, there have been many, many examples of, you know, great uh, caliphs who have not had that lineage. And if there has been any kind of Muslim political power that has been successful at staving off Western colonial power, it is the Ottomans and no one else. Abul Kalam Azad went to the point of saying that it is the Ottomans who delayed Western uh, British colonialism in South Asia or else they would have been colonized much earlier. So that's the kind of back and forth that happens. And that's the traditionalist argument and logic that he employs in making that case. We have others. Um, if I, I do have a, a thought, it's it's I sort of hesitated or wanted to have it towards the end because it's it is definitely moving away from what you're focused on at one level. But um, but it's kind of related to the point that um, Anna raised in the beginning of her question, which was um, at, which is that one might ask. So what are the effects of this debate as it played out then? Um, in terms of 
something as specific as cow sacrifice. So for example, um, you know, as you know, over, over the subsequent decades and say with the formation of Pakistan, is, is cow sacrifice um, uh, resumed in an environment where, uh, and, or central or argued as, as really important in an environment where the Hindu um, friendship issue is, is moot? Yeah, that, that's, that's a terrific question. And I think you're correct in, in, in sensing that perhaps in a sort of Muslim majoritarian context, that particular question does not have the same sensitivity as it may have had at that particular moment. Uh, but these internal debates take on a different kind of form in an afterlife, uh, as I mentioned with the case of Sharjil Imam and others. And there, that whole distinction between slaughter and sacrifice becomes quite crucial because someone like Abdul Bari is clearly making that distinction. And his point is that for everyday practices and slaughter, that's fine. But on specific occasions like Eid for sacrifice, you abstain from it. And by doing that, you show your camaraderie and your uh, sense of sort of hospitality with the Hindu other, while also satisfying the Muslim traditionalist uh, checkpoint and norm that you're not considering, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, cow sacrifice uh, to be an um, uh, cessation of cow sacrifice to be obligated on you or to have been coerced on you. So that distinction then becomes significant, whereas for Ahmad Raza Khan, you don't make that distinction. For everyday practices or for special occasions, slaughter or sacrifice, it is a marker of Muslim distinction. So you're absolutely correct in that this does have a resonance in a particular moment, which is much more intensified. But uh, clearly, the kind of questions that these scholars are getting, they're writing in popular newspapers, like Abdul Bari's the text that I've analyzed, come in these popular newspapers like Hamdam, and uh, 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 you know, a couple of others, uh, 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 names escape me right now, popular ones are just escaping me right now. Um, that this is of course a question which is really pulsating the print media and the public sphere in very, in very uh, uh, you know, uh, profound ways. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. There is something about this moment that captures the kind of intensity and perhaps does not transfer into the post-colonial moment in the same way that it did, say, in this particular context of 1920 or 1818 to 1920. Zamindar is the name of the paper. Zamindar. Okay, any, any other? I think we're about out of time. We can maybe squeeze in one last quick question if anybody has one. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much for an incredibly stimulating and really thoughtful um, talk and analysis of of this material, I think, and, and thank you, Shadipto, for um, really pulling out um, the threads and implications of it. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yubing, and thank you, Professor Kaviraj. That was really a treat. I really, really enjoyed myself, and thank you to everyone for your time and amazing questions. So good to see all of you. Thank you so much.